wanted to say something about the, the title of the talk. Actually, I made up the name of this talk on the spur of the moment because I like the sound of squaring the circle. It sounded kind of cool. Um, and it was purely based on the sort of, you know, the sound of it. And I, and I, but I've started to think about it more and more, and I think it's actually meaningful for the topic that I want to talk about. So here, you know, up front, a diversion onto squaring the circle. So I hope you're all familiar with the, the problem of squaring the circle. Um, the idea is that you have a circle with a certain area, and you want to construct a square that has exactly the same area. And for centuries and centuries, um, since the Greeks, people have believed that that was possible. They just hadn't found the right mechanism yet. And it wasn't until 1882, I think, that it was proved to be impossible because pi is a transcendental number. Um, and anything that's transcendental, you can't do it with a compass and straight edge. So you can't square the circle. It's a famous impossibility uh, result that says, you know, this is just not possible. Um, and yet, for centuries and centuries, people tried to solve it. And the history books are full of quacks who tried to say, I've got a method for squaring the circle. I've invented perpetual motion, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I thought I had a really nice, um, squaring the circle is a bit meaningful when you talk about access and privacy. Because there are, there are two goals um, with genomic data, as I'm going to argue in my talk. You want to share it. You need to share it. And at the same time, there's a lot of really sensitive stuff in there that you don't want everybody to see. So I, I thought squaring the circle actually turns out to be fitting. This page is from an Indian mathematical journal. This is done by Ramanujan, the famous mathematician. And he actually managed to solve the problem very, very close to um, its he got 355 over 113, which is kind of a, a well-known approximation of pi. Um, and he wrote down here, if the area of the circle be 140,000 square miles, then this is greater than the true length by about an inch. So with a gigantic circle, he gets within an inch of the right answer. Okay? And I think that's actually a good, a good way to think about this problem. We shouldn't let the impossibility of you know, the theoretical you know, uh, roadblocks get in the way of actually making practical progress on this problem. Um, I'll come back to that. Anyway, that's my digression. So here's an outline of the talk. Um, part A is, uh, won't somebody please think of the children? Uh, part B is tinfoil hat man. Um, that's, that's actually kind of a joke, but, but seriously, this is, this is the real outline. First assertion is that sharing data is an ethical imperative. Sharing medical data is an ethical imperative. Um, second assertion is that privacy is a fundamental right, and you have a right in this data, but it's really, really tricky to solve the problem for genomic data. And I'll show you why. The third assertion is that these things can conflict. So maybe squaring the circle seems really difficult, or it seems like it can't be done. Uh, the, the final assertion that makes that really inconvenient is that both of those are very, very strict requirements um, for practical reasons and for ethical reasons. So the question is, what do we, what do, we do about it? How are we going to square the circle? Or how are we going to try to square the circle? I want to start on the, won't somebody please think of the children? And there's a few picture, screenshots of, of papers back there, but I'm, I'm going to try to bottom line these for you. So this paper was, the, was a very famous one. It was the first one that showed that whole genome sequencing might be useful for clinical use. So it might be actually useful in practice. And it was done at Baylor College of Medicine. And um, I highlighted children because, you know, it's children with neurologic phenotypes. And if that doesn't, you know, speak to you, then you know, you're irredeemable. Um, what they found out in this paper was that 25% of those kids, when they did their sequences, they found out that there was a causative factor in 25% of the kids. So in other words, there's something in their genome that gives a clue as to what's wrong with them. And things that are in your genome, um, and if we, if we can figure out what they are, we can start to build medicines to help those kids. Okay? That was a quarter of the cases, which is really high. A lot of, a lot of medical studies uncover you know, like 5% you know, of people had this trait, and, and that helps us explain the mechanism. This is a full 25%. So this was the, the very first paper many, many years ago. This came out, um, 2008, I want to say. Uh, and it, it, it says there's, there's really a lot of there there with genomic data. OK, that's, that's the first point. The second one, I, wanted, I want to mention a story that was in The New Yorker last summer. This kid um, is the son of a, uh, a, a pretty well-known computer science professor at Utah. Um, and he inherited two very strange, rare mutations, one from dad and one from mom. 
And he, he basically failed to thrive. He, he, his eyes itched all the time. He was crying. He had uh, delayed development. He didn't move around normally. Um, in this article, they describe him as sort of like a squishy blob uh, of a child. And um, nobody knew what to do. So this kid had gone to doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor. And nobody could help until somebody said, let's do the genome sequence of this kid. Let's figure out if there's anything there. And they found out that there were these two mutations. Great. So problem solved, right? Well, no. Um, nobody knew what those mutations were. Nobody knew what they did. Had anybody in history ever seen those before? Um, you know, nobody, nobody knew what to do with this genomic data. And so um, th this professor, Matt Might, actually Matt m writes a very, very good blog, by the way, if you're into CS, um, outstanding blog. Um, so he and his wife were sort of sent around from specialist to specialist to different genomic centers. Nobody had any data. Nobody, nobody had ever seen that before. And he got fed up. And he said, I have a really popular blog. I have a soapbox. You know, so I might as well get up on the soapbox and start talking. And he wrote an article um, called Tracking Down My Son's Killer. And uh, it went viral. And it was published in the New York Times. And you know, it, it became really, really popular as a result. Some folks in India found it. Some folks in Germany found it who had kids with similar symptoms. And so this never before seen disease that nobody knew what to do with, um, suddenly there were nine cases and then 40 cases and then hundreds of cases um, as awareness spread. Because this guy took the time to write a blog post. OK, if, if, if in this day and age we can't do better than somebody writing a blog post, as a way to, to solve sort of intractable, intractable, intractable medical problems, I, I think we're not doing a very good job. All right, right. So that data, the, the information about that kid needed to be shared, and it wasn't. You know, thank God this guy you know, wrote that blog post. Because had he not done that, who knows where his kid would be at this point. Not to mention all the other kids who've, who've been diagnosed with this condition. OK. So, I, like I said before, I think that's an ethical imperative. I mean, seriously, I'm, I'm joking with the, the, the little Simpsons reference, but won't somebody think of the children? This is important. OK. So next point. Um, OK, I'll bottom line this here. Um, there's an article in Science just a couple of years, maybe last year, actually. About 96% of variants that will kill you, basically, are predicted to be rare. And rare means they're, they're less than half a percent frequency in the population. And, and that actually, if you think about from the point of view of natural selection, that makes a lot of sense. Because if something would kill you, you know, the, the kids aren't going to grow up and reproduce. And, and it, it's going to die out. That, that line will die out if something's really, really uh, deadly. So, so this, this kind of you know, is in accord with, with the way we think about evolution. But the implication for data sharing here is that it's, if you think about a, a database with 10,000 subjects in it, which right now seems like a huge database, there's going to be a handful of cases with any one mutation. Just a handful. Maybe you're lucky if there are one or two. So the idea that somebody could amass a gi gigantic database and then do all the number crunching and solve this problem, it's actually a little bit foolhardy. There is no magic, gigantic size of database that captures all these rare vari variants. I think the implication is if we can't share data across institutions, we're not going to be able to solve this problem. So if, if you, you, know, you can go down to your, your database down the street, and if they, don't have, if they have one or two cases, that's not enough to do any studies on, not enough to, to do any, any science. So, but if you could go to 1,000 of those things around the world, then maybe you have a chance of seeing that stuff, um, seeing those, those rare mutations. OK, so again, another reason why, just based on the, the, the genetics, why we need to share data. OK, so that's the end of the uh, won't somebody think of the children part of the talk. I'm going to switch to tinfoil hat part. OK, what are the threats to privacy with genomic data? My, my, my fundamental argument here is that genomic data is really different from other medical data. Um, and I'm going exp to try to explain why with a bunch of stories that will scare you. Um, but here's, here's the, uh, the highlights. They're inherently identifying. It's like a fingerprint. right? It's really unique to you. That's why they use it for you know, 
uh, forensics and, and criminals and things like that, right? It's really inherently identifying. Um, arguably, nothing is more you than this one string of letters. Um, they can't be changed. So you know, if your key is compromised, you can't rotate it, right? At least not yet. We're working on that. No, I'm kidding. Um, they have unique statistical regularities that make things about them predictable. It takes really very little genomic data to, to uniquely identify a person. So in the same way you guys may have seen with location data, if you have like four locations on a person, that's enough of a fingerprint to, to identify somebody within a certain probability. Similar thing holds with genomic data. If you have, I think the estimates I've heard are like 18 to 20 variants. Um, if you knew 18 to 20 variants in somebody's genome, that's a fingerprint. Uh, you know, and, and it gives you a very high confidence of, of knowing who that person is. This is another really interesting one. Your family is also involved, right? I mean, it I guess it should be obvious that you know, genes run in families, but um, people don't think about that aspect of it when they think about privacy for genomic data. Um, it's not really, so if, if it's you know, other medical data, like uh, my, my x-ray or something, or my you know, the history of my heart rate, that's kind of my decision. That's an individual decision. If it's your, your genomic data, there's stuff in there about your mom and your dad and your siblings and your cousins and your grandparents. So a lot of people come along for the ride on this privacy question for genomics. So it is very fundamentally different. I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that. So here's the first horror story. OK, um, this is a, there was a paper called Modeling 3D Facial Shape from DNA. And a guy from, uh, one guy from uh, uh, Belgium and another guy from Penn State worked together on this. What they did basically was they computed eigenvectors for faces, right? Um, and I'll show you actually some of the, some of the, uh, the eigenvectors. Um, um, these, are the, these are the most important factors that bear on your face shape. So if you had to, if you had to boil somebody's face down to one number, um, you know, it would be some number that tells where you are on this axis. You're somewhere between this guy and this guy. Yeah, yeah. You, you're somewhere between this guy <laughs> so, so if you, basically from a mathematical point of view, if you boil this down, if you had to boil somebody's face shape down to one number, it would be somewhere on this axis. If you had two numbers, then it would be somewhere on this axis and then somewhere on this PC2 axis. So these are the most important predictive factors for what your face looks like, and they got this from the DNA. Um, so I, I think this is actually really interesting. If you look at the shapes of these faces, I mean, some of them are clearly, you know, this guy's clearly sort of uh, British upper class. Uh, this guy, you know, is probably African. Um, this guy looks like uh, Hong Kongese or something. Um, so it's very, very interesting if to look at these. And you, I'll, I'll be happy to make these available to anybody who wants to look. Um, so one of the things they can do with this type of technology is take your DNA and run these predictive models on it and generate a model of your face. And so this woman here is a journalist who came to, um, to, to, to interview these, these scientists. And they said, well, give us your DNA sequence, and you know, we'll, we'll run this model on you, and, and we'll predict what your face looks like. And this was their version 0. And it's already pretty good at version 0. Apparently, they're, they're doing even better now. Um, but this is, uh, you know, this, this is reconstructed from I mean, look at, look at the curvature of her nose, even. I, I find that astounding that they were able to capture that level of detail about this, this person's face. Any, anyway, there, there's, and there's, he has a sequence of these. The professor who did this has a sequence of these for different ethnicities to see how, how close you got. Um, and it's pretty amazing. So when, when people say things like, um, you know, as long as you remove the name and address and social security number from somebody's medical record, sharing the DNA is not really a problem, right? Right? That's what people want to believe. Uh, I'm trying to prove. I'm trying to show you here that it really is true. You say you could take a fingernail clipping, give it to a clever, clever DNA person, and they could show what your face looked like. That is what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So an, another another study in the same vein, and this is this is also really interesting. Um, this is about ancestry prediction. So they took a bunch of people in Europe, and they did the same kind of thing. What are the most What are the two most important factors? If you had to boil somebody's ancestry down to one number. What's the most important factor? If you had to boil it down to two factors, you know, and those are orthogonal axes, how would, you, how would you figure out what it is? Well, it turns out that this reproduces the map of Europe, which should also not be too surprising. 
uh, because a lot of your, the inheritance is based on human migration from the Levant up into Europe. And, and so it, 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 it does make sense if you think about it in retrospect. But this is astounding. This comes just from your DNA or the DNA of a bunch of people. There are clear, distinct clusters for Portugal and Spain, uh, even for Belgium and France, uh, for Scotland and Great Britain. Um, so a lot of very distinct little clusters that you can separate just based on these two numbers that are derived from your DNA. So again, the idea that, I mean, you've seen the police sketches, right? When, when the sketch artist comes and he says, well, you know, what did the guy look like? Well, this is way better because we can say that guy was Scottish or that guy was uh, Bulgarian. I, I don't know, whatever. Um, you, know, you, you can say from these numbers uh, a lot about somebody's, somebody's background, just two numbers. And with the other one, you can get a picture, right? So the, the, the sketch artist is going to be out of business. That's the buggy whip of forensics, I guess. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <coughs> Fascinating stuff. All right. So um, next, Jim Watson was one of the discoverers of DNA. Okay. And when he was one of the first people to be sequenced. And he wanted to make his data public. So, uh, but he was really worried about people... Actually, he himself didn't want to know about his Alzheimer's status. He didn't want to know whether there was anything predictive about Alzheimer's in his genome. And so he said, I, I will make everything public but that. I don't want anybody seeing that, including me. And so the researcher, you know, the people who were publishing it, they complied with that, and they published everything but that stuff about his genome. So out comes this paper, um, 2009. They, pr they found a way due to statistical regularities within the genome to figure out with 99% confidence what his status was based on stuff that was kind of in the neighborhood. So as it turns out, long stretches of, of genes are inherited as a bunch. They're not just like, they're not shuffled perfectly like cards. Actually, they're shuffled like I shuffle cards. There's a bunch, a clump of them together. Uh, actually, a good analogy. Um, there's a clump of them that come together. And so if you see you know, one card that was next to the other one before, it's a very high likelihood it's going to be next to the other one afterwards. Okay, so it's like imperfect shuffling. Um, and so the guy didn't run the analysis and, and you know, reveal the data, but he gave you a recipe for doing it. So this has really interesting implications for protecting privacy. Like if you, if you don't want people to know you know, your, your tendency to have breast cancer with BRCA or Alzheimer's or any of these sensitive Parkinson's, you can obscure that, but people can infer, okay? So when you publish anything, you're publishing information about all the other things that you might be trying to hide. That's really unique because um, it's not true for other types of data. The, there's some unique statistical properties of, of genomic data. Um, here's another one. So this guy, was able to show that in a study with a thousand people, he could he could determine whether somebody was in or out of the study, if there was just it, just one person. He could determine if an individual person was part of the study or not part of the study. This came out in 2008, and before this came out, a lot of people um, like national institutes were publishing data online uh, with no names, of course, or any of that other um, so-called protected health information. Um, but when this result came out. Uh, they, they freaked out and they started to pull everything behind a, a sort of firewall. So now um, there's some roadblocks to getting access to this data that you have to jump through because of this paper. Um, of course, it, it's, there's like a, a key that encrypts that data and that key is very widely shared. Um, so <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not very good crypto hygiene around it, but at least they, they've tried to, tried to do something about it. So here's another one coming back to families. I'm almost done, by the way, with the laundry list of scary stories here. Um, here's another one coming back to, uh, to families. Um, this woman, uh, Miss Goodman's daughter, sued Iceland because the, Iceland has a national uh, genomic database, a national genomic registry. And of course, you can opt out of having your data in it. And she did, because she's you know, worried about privacy. Um, and she applied, her father passed away, and she went to apply for him to be taken out. And they said, the government said, no, um, his data belongs to the ages now. And um, she sued and won because she, was, she and her lawyers were able to, to, to mount a compelling case that 
there was enough information about her in her father's data that she has the choice to, to take him out of it. So there's, even from a, a legal basis, there's precedent for this m m sort of mis mixing between families. In the Netherlands, they actually, if they can't find a criminal, if the criminal's at large, they go try to find a sibling um, to, to get DNA for the criminal. So, so there's, there's all this interesting mixing in families. I thought I would give one um, sort of quasi-realistic example here about Alzheimer's disease risk. Um, this is made up, by the way. This is not my, my Alzheimer's status, but I'm, I'll give you a hypothetical case. Um, there, there are a bunch of different sort of configurations for two variants in your genome. There's two spots in your genome, chromosome 19, that if they're in one state, there's a certain amount of risk. If they're in another state, there's a different amount of risk, and so forth, of developing Alzheimer's. There's one sort of, you know, cherry, 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 where you have a sevenfold risk, a sevenfold increase in your risk of Alzheimer's. Um, so that's, that's the one you don't want to have. This virtually guarantees that you're going to have Alzheimer's by 80. Um, OK, so it, it, it could be considered to be sensitive data, right? So here's a hypothetical case. If I have a particular status, um, E2, E4, uh, that means I have a T and a C, in, in, and a T and a C. So just to explain, this refers to a position in your genome. This is a second position in your genome. I got one T, the base, uh, genomic base T. I got it from mom or dad, I'm not sure which. And I got a C, I got a C from the other one. Okay, so if, if I'm this status, I got in both positions, I got a T from mom or dad and a C from the other one. Um, and let's say that I know that my mom is E2, E2. So I know she's T's across the board here. Then I can infer, I can eliminate possibilities for my father. In some cases, I could probably nail it down to one, but in this case, uh, I know that he's going to have, he's going to be um, this risk, this risk, or this risk, because my mom only had T's, and I got some C's, so I must have got them from dad. Right? So he's, he's got to have a C in both positions. That means you can say conclusively, under, under this hypothesis, right? you can say, um, my dad has an increased risk of Alzheimer's, and he's not party to this discussion. Right. So when we talk about uh, privacy and who gets to say wh how data, are sh uh, data should be shared, um, we have to think about this. Because I, you can, here you can make an inference about my dad and about you know, his insurance risk. And yes, it's, it's illegal to discriminate ba on somebody based on looking at their genomic sequence, but nobody looked at my dad's genomic sequence. So there are a lot of really tricky cases involving your family. Um, one final one. Um, there was, there's a really big database called the Thousand Genomes Project, and they pub published anonymous um, uh, genome sequences, no, no names or anything in it. Uh, this paper, they were able to identify 50 out of those thousand people by name. Uh, and the way they did that was they looked at information in the Y chromosome, which so, so <laughs> the Y chromosome is this puny little pathetic um, wrinkled little thing. Its only function is to make you male. Um, and it, it has, it has no, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. I, no, uh, no, the, um, we knew that about you already. Yeah. Eigenvalues. Yes. Okay. So it's, it's, it, it really is. It, it has very little active function other than to, to make you male. And, um, as a result, the th all the things that are on it are very highly conserved, is the word they use. So they change very little over the generations. So people took this anonymous, so-called anonymous data. Um, they looked at ancestry databases for the same uh, pattern from the Y chromosome. They figured out where some of the ancestors of these folks were. And then they sort of triangulated. And they ended up being able to identify 50 participants. So that's, you know, it's, it's not a huge number of people that were identified. But it, it's, a, it's a proof of concept that you can take third-party data sources, outside data sources, correlate them with stuff that's supposed to be anonymous. You know, imagine if you had some of their sisters and stuff. Um, and, uh, and actually uncover information that was supposed to be private. So I, I don't know of any other type of data um, that, that is this sensitive uh, for, for healthcare. Um, you know, all, all, arguably all of it is, but 
This, this is really weird stuff, and the privacy concerns are very unique. Um, here's, a, here's a fun one. So, so this is published by the, the Personal Genome Project, which is a, a project at Harvard that believes in radical openness of genomic data. Okay, so these are guys on the, you know, who are making fun of us our tinfoil hat. Um, and they, they list a, a, a list of things here that people could do to you if they had your, your DNA information. These are the risks you're getting into if you publish your DNA. Some of them are great. Um, make synthetic DNA corresponding to the participant and plant it at a crime scene. This is great, right? Um, uh, disease, blah, 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 relatedness to criminals, statistical evidence about insurability, things like that. So there's, even the people who are in favor of you publishing everything are saying, here's the kind of stuff that can happen if, if you publish it. They just want to make, make sure you know before you do it. The question I have, I mean, and, and I, I understand the people who do want to share their data openly, right? Remember the, um, won't somebody think about the children part of the talk, right? There are real ethical needs to share data. Um, so I understand where people are coming from. The, the question I have fundamentally is who decides? Who makes a decision about whether your data should be that open or whether you're more concerned about some of the privacy? So this man right here who runs the Personal Genome Project, George Church, um, he, he's, he believes that people should make their data available, that that's, that's the ethical thing to do. And he has very little patience for the sort of privacy uh, attitude. And, and he was interviewed by the LA Times, and they, they asked him, um, you know, what about privacy of this data? And he said, let's just jump to the end game, admit that it's very challenging to promise anonymity, and make it so that, it, which is true, by the way. And this last one is the kicker, and make it so that people don't care about it. Right? So I think he has a pretty dismissive attitude about privacy. And to me, you know, to tie it back to my digression about squaring the circle, it's kind of like saying, yeah, we can't ever square the circle. It's proven impossible. Therefore, screw it. Let's just go home. Well, why try? Let it all hang out there. Right? That, I, I feel like that's his attitude. That may be a little bit unfair. Uh, let me move into um, the boring part, I think, uh, about how do we, actually, how do we do this? How do we mitigate the threats? And I think there are, there are three sort of primary technical approaches. One is related to access control. One is related to anonymization, and one is through cryptographic techniques. I'll talk a little bit about each of these. Um, so here's, here's the state of the art with genomic research. Sort of partition the world into a governed part and an ungoverned part. Governed means, you know, we have some visibility into what's happening. We control the data. Ungoverned means, we don't know. You know. Um, this is the status quo. Move the data to the ungoverned side of the world, Data shared, problem solved. I think you can all see the, the problems with this, right? So all that sensitive data that may be there, um, even if you take the names and stuff out, that stuff is still in this data set. And now that's moved into an ungoverned part of the world where you know, a study like the, uh, the, the, the surname inference could happen. Somebody could take this data set, mine it at their leisure, correlate it with other data sources, and you'd have no idea what was happening. That is, that is the status quo, 85% probably 90% of things work this way now. In fact, if you, um, you, you, you guys have probably seen uh, the, the announcements about ResearchKit in Apple, that's the model. Okay, I, I argue that, that that's not good enough, at least for genomic data, this is, this is not gonna cut it. Uh, you may trust the guy you gave the data to, but he can give it to third parties and you may or may not trust them. It's not transitive like that. Okay, so, it has pros and cons, this model. It's very simple, right? It's the first obvious thing to do. You just sign a legal agreement with the guy on the other side and say, problem solved. Um, it's really easy to use the data. It's like, you know, unencrypted um, video. You can reformat it for whatever device you want. This is sort of the uh, uh, open argument. Um, the cons are, it, it, it's actually really inefficient from a logistical point of view, right? The uh, human genomes are huge. They're like half a terabyte per person of raw data. Now you boil those down progressively as you process it, but it starts out with half a terabyte of data. So it doesn't always make sense to move data across to a, you know, you have a half a terabyte of data and you're sending it to a 12K Perl program. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so it, th here's the damning piece, in, in my opinion. It relies on humans to enforce policies, right? Humans suck at enforcing policies. Um, that's why I, I think if you, 
I, you know, I don't want to say anything uh, about CSERT, but I, I guess I will. Um, if you look at this, the design of CSERT, there's a lot of, of interlocking policies, and there's a lot of people watching other people, right, to, to make sure that there are no screw-ups from a, from, from a policy enforcement perspective. So individual humans are really bad at it. Um, and that's, people have observed in the wild cases where, you know, they sent data out under one research agreement, and um, the, the professor said, well, there's an interesting thing here, so I'm gonna send it to my colleague in Brazil. I trust him, he won't do anything, and that stuff ends up everywhere. So there are cases in the wild like this. Okay, so moving on to the next model. This is sort of the emerging model for genomics. This is what people are doing now. This is the new kid on the block. Um, it's, it's an API model where rather than sending data over there, we put up an API in front of the data and we ask people to sort of come in through the front door. All right, so they may ask for, for some things and we can send them small or large or whatever, it depends on the API. We send them a certain amount of data, but this has a lot of really nice properties, right? Um, there's no extra movement of data. You can do auditing, who touched what. You can do authentication and authorization. Should they be seeing this based on who they are? Um, the cons of this model are you, your, the type of research you can do, the type of work you can do on this data depends on what the API can do. Right? If your API doesn't give you the mechanism to ask the particular question you want to ask, your alternative is to suck more data over and then crunch it yourself in the ungoverned side of the world. Okay, so it kind of collapses to that first case of moving data. Um, it also has potential regulatory issues with exporting data across country borders. Right? So there, there are issues with that. The third model, which is always the good one, by the way, um, is to move the computation, right? So the, the third model, and this is, this is what we're championing with GeneCloud, is to move the computation. So rather than, than having the, the, uh, the half a terabyte of data come over to the 12K Perl script, we're sending the Perl script to the data, right? Um, so the idea is that the computation moves into the governed part of the world. The computation can interact through the, the same kind of API you had in the previous case with the data, and you get all, you, you piggyback on the benefits of that model. You get the authentication, you get the authorization, um, you, you get the clear control over what happens, but you get, you get more than that. You eliminate all of the, the information that may be leaked as a side effect. So if this computation wants to do, to do something that require, that, that the API is not really ready to support yet, in this model, as long as we trust the sort of integrity of this boundary, he can start pulling all kinds of data in. And as long as he doesn't print it out, or release it, or leak it somehow, um, that, that computation doesn't have the side effect of leaking data. The only thing that comes back out of that is, is, the, is the answer. So a, an example might be, if you want to do a study on 1,000 people, and you, you wanted a, a, some sort of statistical number, and so let's say the answer was 76%, right? If your API didn't support that particular query, you might have to get all 1,000 data points back into your computation and then run the stats yourself. So all that information is released as a side effect because in fact that's not what you asked for. You only need that 76%. So this model helps to govern the side effects of information leakage. So that, that's kind of why I like it from a privacy perspective. Yes? Why do you the API? I mean, because you move the um, the, 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 you're right. The, the need for the API is because, as I said, this, this model is what people are starting to do. So if you go to a researcher today or you talk to one in five years' time, they're going to be doing this. The, the pitch you want to make to those people is if you can work in this environment, then I can ingest this computation and it will work exactly as it did before, but you have all this backstop of governance and auditing and so forth. Um, yes. Go back to you know, where you were with your final third. Yeah. Why can you not infer that if I do enough computations, I can just collect enough data and recreate a bunch of stuff? You can. You can. You can. In fact, one of, one of the one of the really big and I think really interesting sort of research-oriented questions are, around this, and this is a dialogue that we're we're sort of starting to have with some folks in Personograph and and with uh, Bob Tarjan, is to understand exactly how much information is, is revealed by the question itself. I mean, it doesn't matter about the side effects because at the end of the day, you do have to ask a question and that reveals information. 
I, get, I can go off on that for a long time, but I'm not going to... Is this not just the reinventing the mainframe and a dumb terminal? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's interesting. Things, the technology moves in cycles, right? And um, I, I'm going to make the argument that, um, that having the computation, governing the interaction between the computation and the data allows us to make certain privacy assertions that you wouldn't have otherwise. I should say that this split between ungoverned and governed doesn't mean that governed is a mainframe and ungoverned is your laptop. Um, because as long as you can protect the integrity of this, computa of this interaction, that can be distributed. In fact, I'll talk about that in a minute. That, that, that can be distributed so that you can send this computation to the 20 different databases that have data that you need to amass in your cohort. And it will work in the same way as it does here. So, I don't mean this governed and ungoverned to imply sort of out in your laptop and then in the mainframe. Um, okay, so a couple of, this is a long list of pros, as you can imagine. So um, it, first of all, you get everything that the API model gets. You get control over side effects. You can, you can make an arbitrary query. In fact, the stuff that we're, we're building right now, you can write a program in any language you want to. There is no bioinformatics language that we're requiring people to use. If it's Perl, if it's Fortran, if it's Java, whatever, Python, anything goes, because as long as you have a way to sort of uh, sandbox that computation, this, this type of thing will work. We th that, that's actually an important feature for a lot of researchers who have lots of legacy code laying around that was you know, made by a grad student 12 years ago. Um, reproducibility and signing, I think you see where I'm going with some of this. If those computations are digitally signed by different trust authorities, uh, for example, if the FDA wants to verify that the, um, the program that you ran over data to prescribe a drug was the exact program that went through the clinical trials, that, that's a problem that can be addressed with digital signatures. Uh, you can also do reproducibility of results. Like if you publish a result, you can also publish the, uh, the, the, the programs that gave you those results, and people can verify that, yes, that actually is what happened. You didn't fudge the numbers or anything like that. So there's a lot of interesting sort of reproducibility things here. Um, as I said before, it can be distributed. So you can send programs out into the, to the four winds, and they can collect data and, and bring sort of partial data back. A lot of really good statistical algorithms where you send a program out, it collects a, a first cut at the data, you bring back those numbers, you iterate, and you send out another computation, and you bring them back and you iterate. And eventually, it's as if you'd queried all the data sitting in one place. So there are a few algorithms like that that, that, are, that are great. And also, you have the ability to, to do policy enforcement, right? So actually pretty, pretty sophisticated policy enforcement. So for example, if, if somebody's data was here, I should, I should say something about the stack of stakeholders, right? Because it's individual people's data but that was collected by a, a professor. Okay, there's, so there's a second person who thinks he owns the data. Uh, there's a third person is the institution that that professor works for. Or it's a, it could be a doctor in a hospital. Uh, they think they own the data because they're responsible for the privacy of it. And they're the ones that are going to get sued. Uh, then there's a state in which that is happening. So the state of New York, for example, has radically different laws from California for this type of data. Then there's the country that they live in. So there's at least there's five people right there who think that they own the data or have some say in how the data can be used. Um, when you start shipping stuff over here, it's really hard to enforce those policies. When stuff happens here and you govern that interaction, you can actually enforce those policies pretty well. So that, that's, that's part of the, I think, the advantage of this model. Um, who, who is you? You say you can enforce these policies. So who is you? Gene Cloud. <laughs> uh, Gene Cloud or people who use Gene Cloud tools um, can can enforce those policies. Uh, th Do all the people who submit the, their data to the Gene Cloud? In my ideal case, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think um, the individual, the individuals from whom this data is derived, those people have typically not had much of a say in the use of their data, and I think they should. Uh, and it, it's disappointing to me that that the medical community hasn't hasn't really embraced that. But I think they're starting to. I think they're starting to. Um, a couple of models. Um, let me not dwell on this too much. But, but this goes to the idea 
that you can take an analysis and you can distribute it to multiple different environments, even ones that haven't fully embraced the gene cloud model, if you put a little front end on it that interacts over the same kind of APIs. If you have trust management between these endpoints, trust management, anybody? Um, then you can actually make some assertions about the security of this system. They're not as good as this, but they're also, they're still pretty good. So there, there's a lot of federation models we can do. There are things we can do where we take a, a I'm not gonna go on this at all, but if you, um, you can take a computation and partition the computation so that no one piece of it has all the secrets in its brain at one time that can be compromised. Um, so you can make sure that it's a bunch of interacting people who work on a little piece of the problem and don't ever individually have all the data. So that if one of those were compromised, it wouldn't leak everything. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about that. Now, why is this interesting for Intertrust? Because if you think about those types of problems, they require trust management. They require secure execution, possibly even remote secure execution. So a computation is happening out of my site. I want to be able to say, say something about it. They require auditing. They require policy management. They require persistent governance. They require an analysis of, of how the information is flowing from place to place. This is, this is st stuff arguably Intertrust has been doing for decades now, actually. So I think this is a great problem for Intertrust to be looking at, frankly, my two cents. OK, so moving on from access control, I'll say a little bit about anonymization of data. I, I kind of. I hope I, I scared you a little bit with the stuff in, in the first part uh, that, you know, the sort of anonymization stuff is, is a bit, um, maybe not, not all it's cracked up to be. There's a couple of techniques I'd like to talk about here. Um, one is called K-anonymity. And it basically, what it means is if you, if you make a query and your query would return only one person, like there's, an in, there's a unique match to your query, then this technique will basically not answer or make up data, or lower the resolution of the answer to sort of obscure, uh, to, to make it less individually identifiable. So you may get a minimum of five people, even if only one person matches a given query. That's, a, that's actually a pretty commonly deployed technique. Um, Canada uses this exact technique because if you make a query in you know, the, the Yukon, um, you know, the, the match may be only one guy. If you ask for, you know, a guy over the age of 65 um, with this heart condition, that's one guy. Uh, so what they'll do is they'll obscure it with things like K-anonymity. They sort of fuzz it. They, they, they make up data. They add noise. Differential privacy is, um, is a similar, in a way it's a similar technique. The idea behind differential privacy is to make it so that you can't tell whether a given individual is part of a data set or not. Um, so if you took that individual out, the, st the statistics of the database would look the same w whether they were in it or out of it. And if you shrink that, if you mentally sort of think about shrinking that down to a really small data set, you'd have to add a lot of noise. In fact, most of your, if you had two people in the data set, then you'd have to add a lot of noise to obscure the fact that one guy wasn't in it. Right? So th this technique basically, th the way I think about th this type of techniques is, is it kind of turns up the static. Um, to, to drown out the, the contribution of each individual. And th it has some very nice properties that you can prove, but at the same time, the data is fuzzy. It's noisy, and it's not obvious that, that it's as useful as it would be um, if you hadn't done that. And so I, I, there's, there's a bit of pushback in the, in the genomics community anyway on, on this, this particular technique. But if you're hunting for the, the son of that kid, yeah. who at the time was the only one in the world that had that condition, and then maybe 200 people in the world have that condition, right. this screws up the study. That's right. It, that's exactly the objection. That's exactly the objection. So it, th this would be sort of privacy at the expense of utility. And I think people are still trying to figure out where that boundary is. So, so that's one of the objections to this type of technique. And, and what kind of tricks do they do this differential privacy on? You've got so many options available. How do they know what to do? Well, so, so differential privacy is sort of a, a general purpose technique um, that you can apply to your specific case in lots of different ways. So there's no sort of universal way to do it. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to convey is that people in the genomics community aren't quite sure how it maps onto genomics yet. So I just thought I would mention it because it's, it often comes up as a, as a privacy-preserving technique. Um, and it's, it's good for us to know about it. Well, it could be a first pass as a way to get the permission for the court order kind of thing, right? You right. do a study, and if, it, if you can't get any results with that fuzzy stuff in, you prove that you need to take the fuzzy stuff off to get the specific. 
That's a, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Right. So if, if, if the stats you get back from the data set are good enough to operate on for you know, sort of everyday purposes, um, you know, th then, and you can make use of it, then maybe there's another access layer um, that goes beyond that. Yeah, good point. Um, and I th I've already covered this. Um, I just wanted to give a quotation here about, about anonymization from a, a guy called uh, Khaled El Imam, who's in, uh, um, I can't remember which university he is in Canada. But he, 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 he wrote in a book recently, most privacy laws around the world are consent-based. If patients give their consent or authorization, the data can be used for the purposes they authorize. If the data is anonymized, however, then no consent is required. In general, anonymized data is no longer considered personal health information, and it falls outside of privacy laws. Well, OK, I think that's true. Uh, the, it's, it, it's true to the letter of the law. But it's not true to the spirit of the law, as I, as I hope I've demonstrated. There are a lot of, there's a lot of personal data involved here. It's, so saying that, yeah, it's legal if I do this, I think that's a, that's a cop out. That's a way to avoid actually solving the hard problem. OK. The, the other technique I want to talk about were a couple of cryptographic things um, that people will talk about for privacy. One is uh, homomorphic encryption. And you've, you guys have probably heard about this, but let me explain. The idea is that you want to do some processing on some data that's protected. Okay, So I've got some data here. I've encrypted it. Um, I want to do some processing on it. Well, in order to do that with the, with the sort of uh, trusted third party model, you have to decrypt it, process it, re-encrypt it, and send it back, send it on to the, to the user. And the, uh, the weak, weak link in the chain is right here. Um, so this, this guy has to be really, really trustworthy. right? That's why it's called a trusted third party. You have to trust that guy. Um, there, a lot of people are, with homomorphic encryption are saying, well, what if, what if anybody could process data? What if, what if anybody could process data without actually having to decrypt it? It's, it's a bit of a pipe dream, but it's, it's theoretically possible. So what homomorphic encryption does is it operates on encrypted data. Right? So you can do a transformation on encrypted data that would give you the same answer as if you decrypted it, then you know, transformed it, and then re-encrypted it. Uh, but you can do that in the encrypted domain. Now, it, it, it's cool, right? It, and it is theoretically possible. Here's the, here's the good news and bad news. Um, it can protect you from that trusted third party not being trustworthy. And you can prove that. And you can let anybody transform data. Uh, under this model. The cons are, actually this is a, a point I think people often miss, at the end of the day, you're actually revealing the data. right? The whole point of this thing is to reveal some information. So no matter how well you protect this processing chain, you are still releasing an answer to a question. right? So there is personal information that's leaked in this, just like there is in any other system. So in a way, you, you should probably think about techniques like this as, as a way to sort of guarantee the integrity of the stuff. Uh, but they're not a guarantee that in personal information is not going to leak. It prevents any leakage as a side effect, or tries to. Um, the, other, the other downside is it requires very new algorithms that very few people know how to deal with. That, that may change. It, it's super heavy computationally. This is two or three, maybe more. Steve Mitchell is the expert on this stuff. Is, um, is two or three orders of magnitude heavier weight than normal computations? Um, six or seven. OK, there we go. All right, so. Yeah, what's a few orders of magnitude among friends? It's really, it's really slow. <laughs> All right, but, it, but it has great potential. And, it, it's, it's, and it, maybe the, the technology will improve, and people will, will get better and better on that. And so that's something we should, we should keep our eye on, too. Uh, as I said, it doesn't, doesn't ultimately solve the problem of, yes, you're answering a question, so you're revealing information. Here's another one that, that's very popular, um, secure multi-party computation. Um, it allows people to, to collaborate and to compute a function without revealing data to each other. Which is, which is really cool. And one application, I love this application. It's a, an Icelandic company. And what they do, uh, so in Iceland, everybody's related, right? There's only like 300,000 people. So you're, you're everybody's cousin. <laughs> and when you, when you go to a barbecue uh, or a bar and you run into somebody interesting, um, <laughs> you, you kind of want to know where you stand. <laughs> relative to that person. And so what this app does, I mean, they had this great tagline which was like, bump your phone before you bump in bed or something like that. <laughs> but um, so, so in this app, you can tap your phones together. And each, each phone holds a piece of the information. They compute your degree of relatedness 
without revealing uh, the information to one another. So I, I think it's a really, that's a really fascinating um, application. Um, and, and, and there, you know, it's, it's, that's, a, that's a fun example, but, but there, are, there are companies, I know of uh, one company that are, are white, uh, sorry, Planet OS friends in Estonia know um, that's working on, you know, genomic data and processing genomic data with these techniques. So, um, you know, it can, it can be used for real serious stuff as well. Um, the pros, it can, you can share results without sharing raw data. It's provably secure. The cons are you have to have specialized protocols for each type of algorithm. Um, there's no sort of magic one way to, to apply this and it just works. You have to sort of design the algorithm and the system together. Um, it is also super high computational complexity, but th that's getting better. That's coming down, actually. Um, I, I think faster than, home, than fully homor homomorphic encryption is. Um, so I just wanted to mention that as well, because that's something that, that often comes up for, um, for genomic privacy. Okay. Almost done. Uh, just in, in closing, I want to say a little bit about some of the things we're doing with this Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. Okay, so this is a, it's an international organization. It's a, it's a kind of a coalition of the willing working on g problems in genomics, including privacy. Um, like everybody who's, who's anybody is at this thing. So the people who made the file formats, the people who designed the algorithms that every single person uses, they're all there. Uh, sort of trying to solve these problems together. Um, there, I think there are 250 companies or 250 entities that are part of it now. And we were one of the first commercial entities that, that, that joined. Um, but there's some really interesting things going on there. And um, some, so I think interesting opportunities for us that emerge out of that. So uh, one example is uh, this so-called Beacon Project. And the idea behind the Beacon Project was to try to do the simplest non-trivial thing with genomic data sharing. And you can, it's, it's sort of like a genomic go fishing question. You can ask, have you, hey, do you have any genomes with an A at position blah, blah, blah on chromosome 3? And the thing will say yes or no. And of course, that, that also reveals information about your data set that shouldn't be discounted. But it's a small amount, right? It's arguably a small amount. Um, so if you th think back to the, uh, the, the kid who was the son of the computer scientist, right? If, if a system like Beacon had been in place, the guy wouldn't have had to write the blog post. Right? Because if somebody's data is going to be in a beacon somewhere, that's the vision. Right? Some, that data is going to be in a beacon somewhere. And you can say, oh, that guy over there saw a similar case. Let me get in touch with him and dig deeper on this. Okay? Uh, so a lot of, a lot of uh, sort of you know, pretty, pretty prestigious institutions that are setting up beacons. There are actually 20 beacons live at the moment. Um, and then there's Bob, which is a beacon of beacons. Uh, the, the intention of Bob is that you ask Bob the query and Bob farms it out to, to the other 20. Does he find Alice? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, so, so um, there, there are uh, uh, a lot, lot of activity happening there. So what's, what's interesting, interesting about this from, from my point of view is that the people, and, and my, my people on my team can, can tell me if they think I'm wrong about this, but the people that are doing this work for the beacon, they know the genomic side of it. They have, I don't want to say no clue, but they, they, they're not as, as, as well versed on issues of security uh, as we are. So it, as part of this organization, I'm chairing a couple of little task teams that are focused on security. I'm seeing a huge unmet need for people in this field who say, I, I don't even know like, how, to, how to deal with authorization. Like, like there's different policies for who can see what data. How do I, how do I deal with that? Um, and there, there's, there's sort of an, uh, a lack of awareness of those problems, and I think there's, that creates an opportunity for us to, to sort of wedge in to, to a lot of these projects. Um, okay, so that's Beacon. Another one in a similar vein, Matchmaker Exchange. Um, this has got uh, some, some really heavy hitters involved in it. Um, but the same idea, and th this, this again would help um, with some of the use cases I talked about at the beginning. Like if you, if you had a rare variant, who's got it? Who's seen anything? Is there is there a medical condition associated with it? So this one goes a little bit deeper than just the genomics, uh, which also raises you know, even thornier privacy questions. And so we're, we're trying to help, help this project design systems and things to, uh, to solve those. The, other, the last one I'll mention is the BRCA challenge. Um, you guys must have heard of the Myriad uh, case, where uh, Myriad Genetics tried to assert ownership over stretches of DNA related to uh, the BRCA gene, which is predictive of breast cancer. Um, 
actually, that's an oversimplification, but that's the way people perceive it. Um, and so the, the National Cancer Institute started a, a, a project called the BRCA Challenge, which also involves multiple institutions sharing data, um, in fact, people's private data, um, to, to try to make sure that there was a wide dissemination of information about those particular genes so that there was no one institution that could turn it off or put a, a licensing toll gate in front of it, uh, like Myriad was attempting to do. That's been made moot by the Supreme Court, I think. But um, that was, that was a, real, a real danger. So this is another one of the, the many projects that are going on there. So um, these are the kind of things we're, we're um, involved in. Um, I'm happy to talk about the specific technology more with, with anybody who's interested. But that is the end of my talk. And I'm only 10 minutes over. So. <laughs> Yes, questions. What's an eigenvalue? I'm usually the one who asks questions at the end of the lecture. Yes, sir. So the problem, I guess, is uh, partially that the genome sequence allows to identify a person from a genome, right? But is it possible to remove those markets from the sequence, making it complete kind of uh, you, you, could, you could remove all the useful stuff, and then it would just be so, so I mean, the, the, the truth is, you share, um, you know, you share at least ninety-eight and a half percent of your DNA with the chimpanzee. I, I share ninety-nine point nine nine percent of my <laughs> DNA with the chimpanzee. Um, so, you, there's a lot of stuff in common. Uh, I mean, actually, stunning. But you share forty percent of your genome with yeast. So, um, so, it, it's. It's actually it's quite incredible. So there's a lot of commonality, and so if you were only seeing things that were standard, um, that 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 wouldn't be very informative um, for any of the studies. So do you only need one percent of a genome to have all the valuable stuff? Um, no, uh, it used to be believed to be the case. Um, so people used to think that you had two percent of your genome was important. And the other 98% was what they used to call junk DNA, which they couldn't figure out what it did. It was sort of like dark matter for genomics. They couldn't figure out what it did. But it turns out that it, it plays an important role in regulation. So you may have a gene that says, you're definitely getting Alzheimer's. Um, but another, another uh, sequence that's part of the, the uh, so-called junk DNA may regulate something, which regulates something, which regulates whether that gene is actually expressed. So what, what people are finding out is that the whole thing's important. And that's why you see, that's what's driving the sort of move from these uh, gene chips that you can do f like with 23andMe or, or National Geographic. Those cost about $100 a pop or 50 bucks a pop. Um, people are moving to whole genome sequencing because it has all of that regulatory stuff. The belief is, over time, we'll actually figure out what everything is there for. Uh, there, there's going to be some stuff that's just junk that's along for the ride that comes from the monkeys or whatever. But uh, a lot of the stuff is really important for, for regulatory reasons. It, it, this is, by the way, this stuff is 10 years ago, the kind of stuff they're doing with genomics would have been science fiction. Um, and you know, now it's actually happening. We're, we're, but there's a widespread belief that we're just sort of on the precipice of understanding uh, how this stuff works. A lot of your DNA also controls things like how do you metabolize sugar? How does your cells stick together? Uh, you know, and, and how do they they uh, migrate through the body as you age and you know grow from feet as and upwards? Yeah, that's the stuff you share with yeast because yeast also faces the same kinds of problems. Uh, how do you process sugar? Um, Who else wants to be compared to a microorganism? <laughs> <laughs> I. Uh, not saying anybody specifically. <laughs> Matt. Any of the Matt. So, so who owns your genomic data after you die? Uh, that's a great question. Okay, so so let me let me answer the another question that that implies. Who owns your genomic data while you're alive? Okay, I'll just tell you my opinion. I think that's um, the wrong question to ask, because I don't think there's. <laughs> yeah, I usually say it's an excellent question, but you know what? That's that's the wrong question. No, um, it's, um, I don't think it's, it's obvious that there's a single answer to that. There are a lot of stakeholders in your data. And so I think to get caught up too much in the niceties of sort of property rights around your, your data, um, that's distracting us from actually solving the problem. Like I, I think if you, if you um, 
let me back up a couple of slides to this lady here. On her sign it says, no one should own our DNA. Um, I, I, I suspect that she thinks she should own her DNA, uh, but she doesn't think any other third parties should own her DNA. Um, but the fact is there are a lot of stakeholders. If, if you are being treated in a medical institution, um, that institution has the legal obligation to protect your data. And so I think justifiably they feel a sense of ownership over your data. They have, they have some skin in the game here. They're stakeholders. So I think the way to frame the problem is what's the stack of stakeholders in your data? And you're, you should be included for sure. It's your, it's your cells. Uh, you, I mean, it's, it's obviously a derivative work from your parents. So I don't know, maybe your parents, I don't know. But there, there's a bunch of stakeholders, and we need to be cognizant of all of those, those people. So it's not, it's not quite as black and white. And as the Icelandic case shows, after a parent dies, uh, or after somebody dies, um, you know, <laughs> your information affects stuff about your children. So uh, I, I don't think from a legal and, and ethical point of view, it's, it's not really super clear cut. Um, all I know is it's probably, here, here's a conservative position. It's really important to protect this stuff because new stuff is being discovered all the time and we just don't know how people are going to be able to fit the pieces together in the future. We need to plan for a future where science gets better and better, the ability to identify people based on these, these characteristics gets better and better. How do we make sure that the, the data are actually um, sort of under, under some governance where all of these stakeholders who are involved in it can have a say on what happens to it? Difficult yes. to govern, though, if you, everywhere you go, you leave a DNA trail, so anyone can pick up on your DNA trail effectively. It, it, it's true in the same way that when you eat, eat, uh, eat in a Chinese restaurant, you know, they take your credit card in the back and swipe it. Um, so you leave your financial data everywhere, too, but that doesn't mean you make your, your bank password available to anyone who wants to see it. It's, it's, that's an analogous situation, I think. I, I, I think that's a, that's a, it seems like a reasonable argument at first blush, but in fact, if you could automate that and you could have, you know, sort of industrial strength uh, hackers working on mining genomic data, as happens with credit card data, that's not a good, that's not a good scene. Uh, sorry, uh, Matt had a question, sorry. Yeah, so you did a good job earlier of, of highlighting that this, the genomic data, this particular data set, is truly unique in that, you know, stripping what we conventionally refer to as PII right. doesn't stop it from being uh, de-anonymized. Right? right. And right. you said it, was, it had to do with the fact that there were a lot of statistical regularities in the data. I'm wondering, if you take other data sets that describe people or their behaviors, is it just a function of, to the extent that there are fewer regularities in those data, which may would make it harder to do, it would just take more greater volumes of those data and you could eventually do the same thing there too. So, right. That's a valid point. This is, so so I, I mentioned earlier that, I can't remember the number, maybe somebody from Personograph knows the answer to this, but um, there was a study that showed if you had four locations on somebody, like a home, a work, and two other locations, three. Three, okay. If you have three locations, that's a, finger, that's a unique fingerprint for a person. So, so you're right, you can, if you had that location data, um, you, know, you could do a lot with that as well to, to, to sort of um, triangulate in on someone. Um, so the, pr the problem of re-identification is not unique to genomics. I guess my argument is that genomic data has these unique features built into the way it works that say a lot more about who you are, what you look like, uh, what health risks you have, et cetera, what your, what your family, excuse me, what your family looks like than any of the other types of stuff does. But you're right, the, the same risk still ap uh, applies. Yes, Kristen. From a business perspective, are there people willing to pay for this? And is it more of a, I mean, what approach to go to market? Or is, is it just Thank you very much. Uh, no. <laughs> that's, that's, the, uh, that, that's, the, um, that's the $64 million question, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, trillion dollar question. No, I, I, I think so. Um, I, I, I'm of two minds about it. On, on the one hand, some of this stuff is so obvious to me that there are risks here. Um, that, you know, it's, it's incredible that people don't see it. Uh, and some people do. Like, uh, I'll give you an example. I, I spoke to a professor at Stanford, um, and he's, he's also a sort of radical openness guy. His name is Mike Snyder. Um, he, he publishes his stuff freely. In fact, he gets gene sequenced and, and gets all the, 
Well, without going into too much detail, there are genomes that are inside your digestive tract. And those can be sequenced as well because they may say a lot about your health. Um, so he gets that stuff sequenced um, every three months and he publishes that online. Uh, so he's, he's sort of in favor of this radical openness. And he goes, you know, um, sh sharing is, is really not, not an issue. People should, should do it. Um, wh what's interesting is that even in his study, he publishes his stuff, but people who are contributing data to his study haven't signed up for exactly the same thing. So even within his group, there are divergent opinions about how much should be, uh, how much should be public. On the other hand, if you talk to somebody who's an administrator at the university, who, you know, you, you put the fear of God into them about, um, you know, all the privacy risks there, the university goes, oh my God, that's an amazing amount of liability I'm taking on by handling this data. So the, the, the lawyers and the, the people who operate the infrastructures, um, hospital administrators, um, CIOs, I, I think they care a great deal about this data. Because when it comes down to it, you can be fined for leaking personally identifiable information to the tune of millions of dollars per person, right? So um, again, to go back to Stanford, you know, some contractor, some subcontractor of a subcontractor at Stanford copied an Excel spreadsheet onto a thumb drive and because it had a macro in it that he didn't know how to make work. And so he took that thumb drive home and he posted that, that Excel spreadsheet on a forum and said, does anybody know how to make this macro work? But the data that was in the Excel spreadsheet was the sort of mental health status of 21 people. And that resulted in $21 million of fines. So the stakes are really high. So I believe that the answer is yes, there certainly are people who care. There are people, the more, there are more academic people. I, I met someone in England, by the way, who, who uh, he's a professor at a university, and he, he basically said, um, we get free health care. So I feel like it's our obligation to make this data available to the government. Um, not, of course, thinking through that his, his government is also trying to sell that out of the back of the van to Pfizer or whomever else. Um, so, uh, you know, there is, there's a spectrum of attitudes about how important this problem is. I'm willing to bet that people will eventually wake up to the difficulty. The, the, the challenge that we have, I think, is to overcome the objections of all this security theater makes it really cumbersome to work to get my work done. I've, in fact, I had somebody say that to me directly from the NIH. He said, like, I'll never touch a system that uses encryption because I can't get my work done. Um, it, as long as that attitude persists, then I think we're not doing our job. Right? We, have to make it, we, we have to make it so that that objection is just not there, which is why um, you know, somebody was asking earlier, maybe Kenny, about do you need the API if you've got this move the computation model? What you want to do is you want to minimize the impedance mismatch between what people are doing now and what they can do with the system. And so that's, that's the goal. But I'm, I'm, I'm willing to bet that, that people are willing to pay. It's easier than the right price point of the software. That's right. Tim. I, mean, I think part of the dynamic that's going to drive the conversation about the very balance around the privacy issue is probably going to come out from the money that's going into the space. Uh, not in terms of the medical potential, but in terms of the PC money making right. potential. Right. I mean, if you've ever given your DNA to the 23 and people, they had some new story a couple days ago about selling off that data that's to right. another company for 60 million bucks. I think. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you can go and have your data withdrawn from that data set. That's kind of an interesting dynamic that people who kind of in a in spirit of trying to help put their stuff in there and not realize, hey, by the way, we're getting rich over here yeah. on the back of your data. No, no, exactly. That, that's case. Okay, so, well, my, no, yeah, yeah. so that dialogue will move around all those different areas, and I don't know where it terminates. The question I have for you is that you, yeah. you talked about uh, this, this church guy. The George Church, church yeah. Church. Um, and then you talked about the guy at Stanford, Snyder, who are you know, radically open. Yeah. You know, you could say, well, that's because they're radical. But I want to know, what's the rational argument for why that might make sense other than that, well, we can't solve this privacy issue? Is there any rational? No, I, I think there is. Actually, there is, and I'm sympathetic to the argument. Um, the argument is, is if there's any roadblock, <laughs> if there's any roadblock, to the dissemination of this data, because, because interesting variants are so rare, if there's any roadblock at all, 
then people will, children will die. Won't somebody please think of the children? I, I think that's the really, uh, well, <laughs> that's what you think. And there's people down the road that might beg to differ, but no. Um, no, no you're, you're right, but I, I, I'm sympathetic to that argument. It's true. It's really true. If there, if there are roadblocks that prevent the sharing and dissemination of this data that um, make it cumbersome or impossible to do, um, that's going to have real consequences. So, so, so that, that, well, right. So, so I, I think that, again, that means that we have to make sure that there's very little friction and very little sort of impedance mismatch between what people are doing and, and uh, uh, the sort of security guarantees we want to make. So my, my, my grand vision is that whatever you're doing now, let me bring that into the fold, and I'm going to take that as is, and I'm going to give you all of these security and privacy guarantees on top of it for free. You're not going to see it. That's what I'd like to accomplish. If we can do that, then, then, then that's, uh, that'll be something. Jack. I'm a little bit confused about the junk DNA. Yeah. Um, if the junk DNA actually regulates, the viewers are suspected of regulating whether or not certain diseases materialize. Mm -hmm. How can you make a lot of claims about these genes that, are, that, that, that exist when there's all this other stuff out there that's very uncertain? Um, is it strictly statistical or is it part of I'm not sure I understood your question. So, oh, oh, so, so how, do, how do people say you have a 17% increased yeah. chance of, of breast cancer if you have this? When got this junk DNA it's purely statistical. It, it's purely statistical. In fact, if you, if you read what people say about sort of the scientific value of stuff that 23andMe has, um, they'll say, well, it's, I mean, it's, it's just, yeah, you're more likely, but that doesn't mean you're, you know. In, in fact, to, to give a personal case, I'm four times, 400% more likely to have celiac disease than the average person. I don't have celiac disease. So there is some regulatory mechanism mm -hmm. that's, that's not expressing that gene going on in my body. And um, so I, I think the FDA, in a way, the FDA had some valid concerns when they turned off 23andMe. Um, because, you know, somebody might see that celiac disease is one thing. Uh, and, 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 you know, truly, if I thought I had a celiac disease, if I started to feel ill when I ate bread or something, and I knew this about myself, I might try to switch to a gluten-free diet or something like that. The consequences are, are minimal. Um, it's different if it's a, it's an, a hyper-increased risk of breast cancer. And, you know, you might be thinking, well, maybe I should have that mastectomy. Yeah. So, so, yeah, but, and, and, and the, the, count, the, the argument the, that the FDA makes, and I think it's reasonable, is to say, you know, that is all statistical. It's not, you know, there's a bunch we don't know about how this is regulated, um, biologically regulated, and we'll find out, but, but we don't know it yet. A lot of the conclusions that are in genome studies are all correlation, not causation. So. Which is another argument for the free access to data, because the more access I have, the more they can do this without just knowing you have the conclusions. That's right. That's right. That's right. It gets more complicated because it may not only be your genome that determines what happens in your body. You have plenty of gut bacteria right. uh, who may regulate for you. Uh, it's really strong evidence for that. Yeah. So uh, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. Thank you. Thank you.